Hello. In our previous video, we talked about uh, one method of market failure and externalities. Today, we're going to talk about a slightly different one that can lead to market failure in public goods. A public good is a particular type of good in economics. We have been primarily talking about uh, private goods so far in this class. What we're going to talk about is the other end of that extreme, public goods. Generally speaking, all economic goods fall into one of four categories. If something is rival and excludable, it's a private good. When we say rival, we mean whether or not someone can enjoy the same good at the same time. An apple, for example, is a rival good. If I'm eating the apple, you cannot eat that same apple at that same time. Something is excludable uh, when, when it is relatively easy, relatively costless, uh, to prevent somebody from enjoying the benefits of the good. Likewise, staying with the apple, it's fairly easy to prevent somebody else from uh, enjoying the apple. I just have to say no and hide it from you. Uh, so an apple is an example of a private good. Something that is excludable but non-rival is called a common resource. This would something be something like a pond or a park. Uh, the park is excludable. You can put up a gate and prevent people from coming in, but it's uh, pretty hard to prevent somebody from enjoying uh, the benefits of it once they're in. Uh, classrooms and education is similar uh, to this. Something that is rival but non-excludable uh, is called a club good. A club good, this is something um, like, uh, well, club goods are hard to, uh, to come up with examples on. Um, finally, what is ri something that is non-rival and non-excludable is what are often called public goods. National defense is the prototypical public good. It's non-rival in that um, if the army is protecting Baltimore, it's also protecting us here in Frederick. That's non-excludable. Uh, when the army protects Baltimore, they can't uh, necessarily stop people within Baltimore from being protected. Um, other examples of public goods uh, include, say, um, sometimes uh, certain kinds of uh, broadcasts, radio broadcasts. It's very hard to prevent somebody from um, getting into the radio if they tune it to the right frequency. Um, what's note what to note about this is when we use the word public here, we are not talking government provided. A public good is not necessarily government provided. Governments do tend to provide public goods for reasons we'll talk about in a moment, but not everything a gov government does is a public good. For example, food stamps. When government provides food uh, for people, that is a private good. Food is rival and excludable. Education is a common resource. It is excludable and it is non-rival. If you don't believe me, try not paying your bill to Frederick Community College one of these days. They'll exclude you pretty fast. So uh, not everything provided by government is a public good. So do not fall into that trap. Public goods tend to suffer from the free rider problem. Since they are non-excludable, it's very hard to prevent anybody who has not paid, uh, who has not paid or has not paid fully to get, uh, to get the benefits of the good. As such, public goods tend to be underprovided by the market. Since we assume that firms are profit maximizing, if they uh, cannot get fully compensated for the costs they have to incur, they will tend to uh, revise downward their production. Uh, with public goods, there's a role of government simply to provide the good. Simply to provide the good. The government can overcome the free rider problem through its unique powers of taxation. Government can compel people to pay whether they want to or not. A, a uh, private company does not have that ability. One of the interesting things, however, is there are extraordinarily few cases of true public goods in the world. 
a true public good would have to be something that absolutely everybody accepts as being good. Since value is subjective, it's hard to find something, even like national defense, uh, where uh, everybody accepts it to be good. Furthermore, issues of rivalry and, ex and uh, excludability are matters of cost. How much are you willing to pay to make something rival and excludable? And it's a matter of scale as well. Depends on uh, what, uh, how big of a geographic area we're looking at. The US military uh, defending Los Angeles does help defend Los Angeles and California, but it doesn't help Mexico a whole lot. Furthermore, other examples of pure public goods. Uh, the lighthouse and the light ship, for example, uh, have largely been provided in adequate levels by the private sector. Uh, Ronald Coase wrote a famous paper in 1973 on how the lighthouse has in England historically been provided by the private sector and is thus not a typical public good that justifies government intervention. And uh, my colleagues, uh, my colleague uh, Vincent uh, Golosko and uh, um, Rosalino Candela at Georgia Mason University uh, wrote a paper in uh, a few years ago on the light ship using a similar line of argument. So just because something looks like a public, public good does not necessarily justify government intervention. So we talked about externalities, public goods, and monopolies are all examples of potential market failures. But actually identifying a market failure is very difficult. Just because something checks one of these boxes as an externality, as a public good, or as a monopoly, or other things uh, that may move us from allocative inefficiency, uh, does not necessarily imply that they are a, a market failure. Especially not once we consider transaction costs. If the transaction costs of overcoming a potential market failure, like an externality, are too high compared to the benefits, then the market is already at an optimal level. We're all already allocatively efficient. The perfectly competitive market, the PPF that we looked at, assumes that there are no transaction costs. If there are no transaction costs, then we will move uh, to that optimal level. Externalities will get negotiated away. Um, et cetera, et cetera. However, if there are transaction costs, we need to look at the benefits compared to the costs. Uh, if the costs are too high compared to the benefits, then actually trying to overcome the market failure through government action or something else could move the market away from allocative efficiency. It's not always optimal to break up a monopoly. For example, last video we talked about a monopoly in a uh, in an externality situation. It's not uh, always optimal to negotiate away every single uh, externality. So as such, we have this uh, little bit of a table here that I created. Uh, over here on the, on the left-hand side, uh, we have uh, the results of a decision whether to engage or not engage in a transaction and whether uh, the expectations about costs and benefits are correct or incorrect. So if you have an, uh, correct expectations about the costs and benefits and you decide to engage in that transaction, the transaction happens and uh, we are at an allocatively efficient point. Uh, this, is your, this is somebody negotiating away an externality, for example. If your expectations about the relative costs and benefits are correct and you choose not to engage, then the transaction does not happen and we're at an optimal level. This is somebody not negotiating away an externality, even if the externality is there because they suspect the costs might exceed the benefits. An example of this is uh, you're walking along in the park and somebody is smoking a cigarette nearby. You could negotiate that uh, externality away, but few people do. Chances are they'll find some other less costly method of dealing with the externality. So the market is still at an optimal level here. If you were forced to negotiate away the externality, the market would actually be below allocative efficiency. If uh, expectations are incorrect, 
and people engage, so they miscalculate either the costs or benefits. The transaction does happen, or it doesn't happen. Uh, yeah, the transaction does happen, but it's not market failure per se, since uh, we, we had incomplete information at the time, and it wasn't obvious that the information was incorrect until after the transaction happened. We can't really call that a market failure, and there's really no role for government uh, at this point. Finally, only the, f the fourth area here is where um, there is a market failure. If people's expectations about costs and benefits are incorrect and they choose not to engage. For example, if you incorrectly estimate uh, the benefits or the costs of negotiating a market failure uh, or an externality away, then uh, there does appear to be a role for government in that particular situation. So we have the situation here where not everything that appears to be a market failure is necessarily a market failure. Um, but market failures are an important part of economics. And market failures represent market opportunities for entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs tend to make money in, si in situations where there are market failures.